Professor Melanie Johnston Hollett is an expert in radio astronomy and has designed, constructed, and governed multiple international radio telescopes. Her background spans theoretical physics, pure mathematics and computational science. Melanie has been chairing various international cooperative efforts, the latest being the Square Kilometre Array, which has one core site scheduled to be installed in the Northern Cape province, South Africa. Well, good morning, everybody. This podcast is made possible thanks to the Holman Prize for Blind Ambition, uh, which is organized by uh, the San Francisco Lighthouse for the Blind. And today we're going to talk about the Astro Hunters podcast. We have a um, a very interesting guest. Her name is Professor Melanie Johnston Hollett and she teaches uh, astrophysics and also is one of the main persons involved in DMWA. So we'll talk about this a bit more but today's topic is actually radio astronomy. So thank you Professor Melanie for Hello. giving us the chance to, to interview you today in Perth. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you. I'm very excited. Okay. Well I guess we could start from the beginning what, of time or my life? Your life, yeah. <laughs> How did all of this start? How? Um, so it, it's a slightly cliched story, but when I was a very small child, my grandmother used to take me outside and we would sit on her back step and she would show me the night sky and talk to me about the stars. And so I developed a, a fascination at a very early age with the night sky and I was extraordinarily stubborn as a child. And so I said, well, that's what I'm going to do. And so that's how I ended up being an astrophysicist. Um, in the course of doing this, actually, I found out that everything that my grandmother told me about the night sky was wrong, but that's okay. It was still the source of inspiration, if you like. Mm, I, I can completely understand because I've actually done the same thing. Uh, it's a common theme, actually. Yeah. Fascination with the, the night sky and understanding what's out there and your place in the universe, I think, is universal to the human condition. So why are we here and what's out there and what does it all mean? It drives human curiosity. So yeah, it's a common path, I think. Yeah, that's right. And we're able to also reflect it back onto uh, onto our planet and trying to understand it better. And, um, so today is going to be one of your really kind of, it's your focus and your expertise, which is radio astronomy. Uh, could you give us an overview of what radio astronomy is? So radio astronomy is just uh, the astronomy that we do using the radio part of the electromagnetic spectrum. So the universe is full of objects that emit across the electromagnetic spectrum and our eyes are just one type of detector that sees in the optical. but. That's a very limited part of the electromagnetic spectrum and so we're fortunate that we can build detectors, in this case radio telescopes, that can detect those parts of the spectrum that our eyes can't. So your eyes are only able to detect a certain and very small part of what the universe is transmitting and so radio astronomy has a much larger window on the electromagnetic spectrum. So that's really what it is. It's akin to um, X-ray astronomy in the sense that we build X-ray detectors to see the X-ray parts that are being broadcast or gamma rays or anything else. Mm. So that's that's the basic principle. So certain animals are actually able to pick up those uh, those frequencies which we don't really do ourselves. Yeah, so animals have very interesting eyes and of course the famous one is the mantis shrimp which has the, the widest range of um, receptors for different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. Although I don't believe it works in the radio, it works in the ultraviolet and um, just beyond optical. So mm. yes, animals perceive the world very differently to humans because they have basically different detectors. But humans have very large brains as it turns out and we can build ourselves uh, machines and tools to be able to expand our range um, basically across the entire spectrum, which is kind of cool. And interfacing with all of, the, all of that spectrum through those instrumentations. Uh, Absolutely. That event, uh, yeah. yeah. Um, on the way here, we were asking what the, one of the main dishes around Perth was, and it was a uh, garlic shrimp. Uh, so I don't know if we're actually going to go for this, this. The seafood here is pretty good. You should give it a crack. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So there's all sorts of ways that, that we can observe, and I guess uh, some of the main instrumentations available are the long wavelength arrays, the low frequency array, the very large array, and the, I, I don't want to butcher this, is the Murchison mm -hmm. wavelength array, which is the MWA. Yeah. So could you give us a bit more of a of an understanding of this this, this array? This yeah, array. So, so the MWA is a low frequency radio telescope. It's comprised of just over 4,000 individual antennas, which we group together in tiles of 16. Uh, so we've got 256 tiles out in the desert in the Midwest of Western Australia. 
and it, it looks a bit like a, a sort of a metallic spider, a collection of metallic spiders, but it's more akin to your TV aerial than anything else, but it operates between um, 70 and 300 megahertz, so that covers your FM radio band, so your FM radio band is 88 to 108 megahertz, and so we actually receive transmissions in that band, and for that reason we have to actually build the telescope away from people out in a very, very remote part of Western Australia because we don't want terrestrial interference, so we don't want to pick up man-made signals. We want to be able to um, pick up the very faint signals from the universe. So it's a telescope designed to look at the low frequency parts of the universe, but look at it in a very sensitive fashion on an amazing site, which is actually legally protected in Australia uh, from spurious transmissions. So uh, it's obviously a detector array where we produce a large amount of data. Those data are correlated together, so the signals are compared between each set of um, antennas, or tiles in fact, and um, we transmit that from uh, the site down fibre optic to here in Perth, and then we process it and turn it into images which our brains can then understand. Mm. So it's a kind of overview of the of the instrumentation, if you like, as opposed to what we do with it. Yeah, uh, I heard this, there, there's something called the Manta Ray uh, API, which uh, we can connect to uh, in order to get the, the, the some of the radio data, but what kind of um, resolution does it have in terms of, uh, you know, when you look at a point in the sky with, a, with this array, um, are you able to get certain, like, let's say if we translated it to a pixel resolution, yep. uh, do we have some form of, you know, time-based pixel resolution that we can actually stream through? Uh, yes, yeah. so the MWA is not a particularly um, high resolution pixel size telescope, so our antennas are spread out over just under six kilometers, mm -hmm. and it's the separation between your two furthest antennas that gives you your resolution. So the further they are apart, the higher angular resolution you get. So with the MWA, um, at the frequencies that we look at, we, we're looking at about an arc minute resolution. Um, so it's not a high resolution low frequency telescope like say the low frequency array in the Netherlands, which does considerably more than that. Um, but that's enough to be able to resolve uh, enormous amounts of structure that we see in our galaxy, for example, the Milky Way. So you can look for supernova remnants, you can look at nearby radio galaxies. Um, we've made a survey of the sky uh, a few years ago now uh, where we did sort of 20 radio bands, so 20 radio colours, if you like, of three quarters of the sky and looked at 300,000 radio galaxies. Um, time resolution is, is different, so if we're looking at um, streaming the signal, we can change the rate at which we can press the data. Uh, so we can get this down, I think it's a, a, the technical the technical team will be unhappy with me, but I think it's 10 seconds at the moment, but I don't know off the top of my head. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, they can go down to lower than that. I think it's two, two is the triggering time. I'm not sure. Anyway. Okay, mm. okay. so the, the, is this the cadence uh, we're talking about? Yeah. Okay, yeah. but that's an enormous quantity of data. Uh, is there a lot of it which gets lost, or is it all actually recorded? And then. Uh... Now we have zero packet loss, which is nice. Mm. Um, so we record the data on site and do the correlation on a supercomputer on site mm. before we then transmit the correlated data down here to the Pawsey Supercomputing Center, which is actually next door in the building next door to where we're sitting. Um, one of the things that we're looking at potentially in the future is actually trying to stream the raw data from the site and do the correlation here, but we're limited by packet loss at this stage, so that we can't do yet. But right now, no, we don't have a problem with the way that the data are collected and uh, cross-correlated and then transmitted to the supercomputer here for imaging. Hmm. A PhD student at uh, UQ is currently working on black holes and dark energy, which is kind of a big topic, I guess, like, yeah. He said that uh, we're talking orders of petabytes yeah. per day. Um, so the SKA, the Square Kilometre Array, which the MWA is a precursor telescope to, will produce of the order of a petabyte of imaging data per day. Um, the MWA produces just over a petabyte of data a month. So we've got around 35 petabytes of data sitting in the long-term archive here in Perth. Um, and as we upgrade the instrument, uh, we will increase that data rate probably by a factor of eight if we get to do the upgrade I want to do. So that's basically so six kilometers of distance between the two uh, most distant antennas, yep. which give a certain you know arc minute uh, resolution. Correct. Over three years, and that information has zero packet loss. 
That's my understanding, yes. So that would mean that is there still a lot to it's it's a treasure trove, and maybe there might there might be some some points in the in the sky that have not been really analysed. Oh guess. God, yes. There's yeah. there's so much stuff that we still want to do. So we can we're just sort of looking at the tip of the iceberg. So the MWA has specific scientific goals uh, that we're trying to achieve. So. One of the things that we were trying to look at was to see if we could detect the radio component of the cosmic web. Mm -hmm. So, you know, radio is um, able to detect electrons spiraling in magnetic fields through the process of synchrotron radiation. Synchrotron radiation. Yeah. 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 And, and in fact, a lot of what we do is synchrotron ra detect synchrotron radiation. Mm -hmm. um, and matter is not distributed uniformly in the universe. So, if you could step out and see the universe as a whole, you would see this sort of spider web like. Uh, structure of where the galaxies sit yep. and we believe that there should be a diffuse low surface brightness synchrotron component associated with that mm -hmm. so in order to be able to detect that you need to have a telescope which is extremely sensitive to signals on large angular scales yep. which we are in a site which is not heavily polluted by mankind's radio transmissions and um, which you're capable of then sort of processing the data to sort of high fidelity and, and calibrating out the instrumental effects. So we've been trying to do that. We haven't been successful, but um, it's been a really interesting project in and of itself. So one of my PhD students is actually working on that. The other thing that we're trying to do is we're trying to use the MWA and a large number of other low frequency radio telescopes uh, to detect the epoch of reionization which is the period in the history of the universe when the first stars and galaxies formed. And we think that this is somewhere between 400 and 700 million years after the Big Bang. And we're very fortunate to be able to use the signal from redshifted neutral hydrogen to be able to detect that. But it's an extraordinarily faint signal compared to all of the foregrounds in the 13 billion year history of the universe after the first stars and galaxies formed. So in order to be able to detect that, again, you have to have an instrument which is at the right frequencies, which we are, on a site which is extremely pristine, which it is, but then you have to be able to calibrate and remove all the instrumental, environmental and ionospheric effects from your data and be able to see if you can see this global uh, signal from the epoch of reionization. And there's a race around the world with various telescopes to try and do this, and right now MWA has the three lowest limits on detecting the EOR but we haven't, haven't got there yet, but uh, we're doing pretty well in that particular endeavor. Okay, so this, um, th it seems as though, uh, from what you're saying, there's, there's really a lot of collaboration and overlap between all of the sites around taking, um, I guess, a snapshot um, of the same position in the sky, but with different spectrums. So you were talking about this galactic uh, database. Is that the GLEAM? Yeah, GLEAM right. is um, our survey that we did of the sky. So we, we can see three quarters of the sky with the MWA and um, the GLEAM survey was the process by which we went and observed across the entire sort of accessible frequency band of the MWA. Of the MWA. And so we did a process where we split the data into uh, smaller frequency pieces. So there's actually 20 uh, individual radio images of the sky from the GLEAM survey. So if you think of it in, in terms of colour, that's sort of like having 20 radio colours, as I said before. So is that kind of like applying an FFT and then bidding the FFT and then setting it back as a separated set of... Um, uh, oh, well, everything we do is using FFTs. Yeah. So basically interferometry is a process where you're taking signals between pairs of antennas and uh, correlating them together and you have to use fast Fourier transforms in order to be able to turn those into images. So everything we do is FFTs, although the actual data splitting itself isn't an FFT process. That's just a raw um, channelization process. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we're always using FFTs and inverse FFTs in radio astronomy. In fact, our correlators are doing that all the time. That's essentially how they work. They, they do multiplication and addition mm -hmm. so that they can do fast Fourier transforms. So that's great because it's almost, a, you know, if you, if you imagine just an image, uh, a full color image, then you separate it to its RGB components, then in this case with radio astronomy, we're breaking it down to even smaller sets in order for yep. us to, uh, to identify something. Yep, know, something exactly, like, yeah. exactly. And so then what we can do is we can look at how much energy is detected by a certain object or from a certain object in a certain frequency uh, band, and that then tells us something about the physics of what's going on in that object. So yeah. that's where we actually get to do science. So we can look at what's called the spectral energy distribution of objects. Yep. And the cool thing is, coming back to your point about comparing it to um, 
other frequencies is that you can do that across the entire electromagnetic spectrum. So we can take very sort of fine data in the radio with the MWA, but we can compare it to optical data, X-ray data of sources that emit over that broad spectral range. Yeah. Um, and so one of the papers that you worked on, uh, low frequency transients? Oh uh, yeah, transients, yeah, they're big, they're very popular. Was, you specifically used a method by comparing two catalogs, so which is the Gleam and the TGSS. Yep. Both uh, have kind of different uh, periods at which they observed or took a snapshot of the sky. Mm -hmm. um, both have different kind of engineering issues, you know, such as possible interference yep. from human band uh, emissions and transmissions. And there are quite a few factors as well for that. But can we speak about those those transient objects? They, they seem really fascinating somehow. They, they have something mysterious which are attached to them, and I'm sure we can demystify that a bit. Well, I think we need more data to demystify it. Which oh, is, it's, uh, not, it's, okay, <laughs> it's not demystified yet. No, not, not completely. Mm. So, um, you know, if you look at the history of radio astronomy, we've been taking data um, since Grote Reber in the early sort of, well, sorry, mid 30s. Yeah. Um, but we haven't really looked at it in terms of the time evolution of sources very much. So, transient sources which blink on and off in the radio on short time scales are not things that have been very well studied until recently. Yeah. Sorry. Yep. Um, I gotta go. But he's just finished, so Tara's next. Okay. Okay, that's fine. We can. We, we pick can... that back up? Yep, we'll pick sorry. that back up. Can I leave you guys here? It's only 10 minutes. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's fine. Or do you want to like get a get some to come we'll and talk get to you? Maybe we'll get a coffee. I would love a coffee. All right. Um, <laughs> Is there a machine? coffee spot? Yes, yes, yes. If you come, yeah. come with me. Um, uh, do you want to stop it? Both recording and. So I saw that in one of your papers, uh, you used the uh, the Gleam data set and the TGSS to figure out or to try to identify uh, what are transient emissions? Yeah, so one of the interesting things about radio astronomy is that in the history of radio astronomy, which actually commenced about 80 years ago, we've primarily not looked at things which um, blink on and off in the radio on short time scales. So uh, a really new and vibrant field of research in the radio is looking for transient radio sources and trying to understand where they come from. And in order to be able to do that, we need to look at data sets with the same frequency potentially and different cadences. So in this particular case, we used the TGSS, which is a survey done on the giant meter wave radio telescope in India, and um, Gleam, which was a survey done on the MWA. They're at similar frequencies, but we're taking at different times. And so by doing that, we can look for things which have changed between the two uh, data sets in order to be able to see if there were these transient sources. So we know, for example, that um, active galactic nuclei do have variable emission on sort of timescales of years. But what we were looking for was things which were switching on and off more rapidly than that mm. and trying to then understand those sort of things. So there's a whole class, new sets of classes of radio sources that have come um, into the literature, you know, only in the last sort of maybe 15 years, mm -hmm. which are uh, things like fast radio bursts, um, the uh, rapidly rotating transient sources, things like this. And so we're now starting to study those in detail. It's really useful to be able to compare data sets from different instruments to validate um, any kind of detections that you make. So there's some, some properties of these uh, transit emissions which can actually come out from brown dwarf flares? Yes. Or Jupiters? Um, yep. Some exoplanets also do some emissions, potentially. Yep. Yep. Uh, uh, we spoke about uh, radio pulses, so coming from pulsars, I guess, and yeah. they have a varying degrees of, of emission, some very rapid. I heard some, it just sounds, um, it just literally sounds like a, a, you know, like a single blip that is repeated very, very fast. Yep. Uh, and those can also kind of, uh, there can be quite a distance between each pulse as well. Yeah, so pulsars have highly variable timing. I mean, pulsars is probably the one transient radio source that's been well known for a long time since Jocelyn Bell uh, discovered them during her PhD thesis. Uh, and so they've been well studied. But yes, they're rapidly rotating, highly magnetized stars, which uh, give rise to these sort of pulses, which can have cadences on, um, you know, sort of relatively long scales down to milliseconds, so they're rotating super, super fast. 
Um, and as you mentioned, other things give rise to you know intermittent radio emission. So we've observed um, Jupiter, for example. So the um, ionospheric and um, auroral storms on Jupiter produce radio emission, and so that had been looked at with the VLA probably 20 years ago. But seeing those sort of types of emissions in other exoplanets has been a, a search that we've done with the MWA and that other people have done with other low-frequency radio telescopes. So we expect to see these things. Um, we're not quite there seeing them at the, the level we expect, probably due to sensitivity issues. But yeah, we can start to make these sort of searches, which is kind of fun. So the VLA is the Very Large Array. That's one of the, the arrays that we've actually mentioned at the beginning. And so uh, that's one of the sources of data that can be used to to really identify those, those phenomena. That's, that's really cool. And one of the objects you said were um, active galactic nuclei. So these ones are actually very... They are transient, but that transiency, is, it, is that because of what happens with the accretion disks? And yeah, exactly. So okay. you have a variable rate of material potentially falling into your black hole, and so the jets that are emitted from the supermassive black holes that then give rise, that host these active galactic nuclei that can give rise to radio jets, um, they can stop, they can restart, they can um, you know, be continuous, or they can just suddenly die. And so we see all these types of phenomena, but the time scales for them having that sort of variability are quite long compared to things like pulsars, where you're seeing something on millisecond scales, yes. and these things like fast radio bursts, which are also on very high um, cadences. Mm -hmm. So AGN variability has been known about for quite a long time, um, and so it's one sort of long time scale transient source, but the more exciting ones, the, the really rapid ones that we're starting to uncover in big numbers at this stage. I guess when you take radio astronomy <clears throat> in its analytical form, you also rely a lot on the other parts of the, so like, you know, the light spectrum. Um, and do, could you see a way all of this composition of different frequency bands and ranges of frequencies, you use this in a very visual way and in my work I'm trying to actually really kind of represent this in a very sonic way and yeah. sometimes some of the approaches that I've taken has led to some really disgusting sounds. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Trust um, us we make really ugly images too. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I try to really kind of you know put the design element to making the sound both intelligible as well as non-invasive or uh, in you know the minimum possible way invasive or you know to give as much information without really incurring uh, you know throwing the headphones against the wall and things like that um, what kind of illustrative sound design could you think of when you think of how you observe a, a graph and you decompose that graph into it, its parts um, could you see some form of either a rhythm that could give you an indicator or actually a, a non-rhythm? Are there some asymptotes, you know, some points where uh, a blip goes so high uh, off the, the actual range that, you know, it just cuts off the actual radio side. And then that's when you need to go and look into some other catalogs with other bands, you know. So let's say you remain within the UV, but for some reason, something occurs such that the sound, uh, the, sorry, the signal actually goes beyond that range and you need to correlate it perhaps with another catalog from a different uh, you know, data stream. Yeah, so transient radio sources can sometimes have this where you see them, say, flaring, for example, in the X-ray, and then you'll get radio emission that follows that with some time delay. Mm. So we often see a time delay in um, when various parts of the electromagnetic spectrum would be detected for transient sources. Depends on the type of source. Mm. So you could potentially um, translate that into sound at frequencies that humans could detect, which is similar to what we do when we translate radio images into colours that we can see. Yep. Um, and then from the soundscape itself, you would be providing information about what it was that you were looking at hmm. and how it was uh, transmitting in one part of the electromagnetic spectrum to another. You could, you could certainly do that. Um, and, and you mentioned the delay, so let's say if you start it with something with the UV, which is kind of high frequency, and then lower frequencies uh, yeah. follow through with a lag, uh, with some, some, some form of delay, and also kind of a decay component to it, 
yep. um, there could be some quite interesting sounds that come out because you could have a very quick short burst and then in other uh, areas like ranges of the electromagnetic uh, magnetic spectrum you'd have that following reverberation almost uh, th is does that have something to do with the baryonic acoustic oscillations uh, it's not to do with the baryonic acoustic oscillations it's just in this particular case to do with the physics of an individual source yeah so you could imagine a soundscape which was describing that change in emission across the electromagnetic spectrum. Mm -hmm. um, an interesting additional idea is that some of these things transmit, say, continuously in the optical. So you yep. could have a tone underpinning the whole thing to represent that mm -hmm. when you had other tones which were um, coming up and then dying away, representing the decay as you move through different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. There could be some really interesting... Um, results from that mm. i mean it could sound horrible i don't know but that also depends on what frequencies of sound you pick to represent the frequencies in the electromagnetic spectrum so that humans can hear them i mean of yeah. course the electromagnetic spectrum the light has an inherent frequency it's just that it's normally not in, within our hearing range so just like we translate the the wavelength into a color in the in the uh, optical part of the spectrum you would be doing the same thing um for the frequency of for the sound. Yeah, uh, yeah, I've made some modulations and actually starting from a very kind of very strange a rapid sonar pulse kind of a sound effect, I uh, was able to interpolate the values so that they created overlapping sine waves, which are clean sine waves, oh, yeah. uh, cool. but which all agreed, you know, with the decay and, you know, the increase in the peaks. I had an idea. <laughs> yes. So, um, <laughs> The images that we make with an interferometer are essentially a series of um, sync functions which you can approximate yeah. potentially as, as sine waves, but they're not complete. Mm. So we only have, with an interferometer, a certain set of uh, these things that we can detect. Mm -hmm. And the more elements that you have in your interferometer, um, the more uh, of them that you can put together and get something which is you know, a better quality image. Yes. You could make a soundscape representing different interferometers. Yes. to show how they could see things, um, but through using the pure sort of representation of, of sine waves or sync functions if you needed to. That'd be cool. Yeah, it's funny because uh, I was at this place called the Space Event and I just did a, a speech using oh, my app which kind of shows the different constellations around it. What I mapped is the spectral category associated to the level of chimes. Um, so if you have a, uh, an early star, it would be a very kind of small chime. Yep. Uh, and then the older they get, then the bigger the actual wind chime. Uh, but then as they get older, you hear more bamboo, metallic clangs, things yep. like that, kind of dying things. And the representation kind of gives you an overall view. Obviously, it's a very 30,000 kilometer away kind of overview yep. of the symphony. But what you said, your approach is basically something as if uh, what I did is I asked everyone to click their tongues and oh, yep. created this swarm of different frequencies of sounds coming yep. and moving left and right uh, because of each person's unique yep. reaction yep. Uh, and I think yeah uh, you hit it you hit the nail right there like you know on the, the the way it could be represented I think that could be really nice because um, there are a lot of papers which do say that the delay of reaction when it comes to the touch it's uh, 46 milliseconds uh, to sound is 86 milliseconds right. and visual is 148 milliseconds yep. so we are able to really pick up on the smallest nuances even though there's a huge number of sounds that are you know bombarding us at the same time so that's a really interesting thing that's that's super cool yeah the other other interesting thing about this related to this is you know that square waves are um, the combination of a fundamental frequency plus higher and higher frequencies so that you get that sort of square wave yeah. uh, signal. Yeah. So in spatial filtering, which we do a lot with interferometers, mm -hmm. um, you're taking away some of those uh, components. So if you take the high frequency components away, mm -hmm. you move more towards your fundamental frequency. Yeah. When you translate that with a Fourier transform into an image space, uh, that translates to making your image blurrier. Mm -hmm. So the high frequencies give you the sharp details in images so there could be a really interesting um, comparison yeah to sort of play soundscapes that represent um, sharp images and high frequency components and things that are nice and crystal clear and then mm -hmm. moving towards stuff which is 
less clear as you do sort of spatial filtering, which we do a lot in radio astronomy. So yeah, that'd be cool. I mean, to, to bring it back to, to the actual paper is that you've done the time-based comparison between the, uh, the Gleam and the TGSS. Yes. And you kind of filtered out anything that had, you know, less than 0.97 ratio, of, you know, similarities, I guess, uh, between the two catalogs. And it seems it's quite interesting because you had a lot of candidates at the beginning. Yeah. And then you ended up with one. Then you passed it through a second, a second thing. And yep. one of the methods I wanted to understand is what is flux density? Uh, so that's essentially the amount of energy um, per unit area that an object emits. So okay, if so you... It's like a mass uh, of... Uh, it's not a mass. If you imagine... A, I don't know how I'm going to explain this. Imagine a sphere mm. and um, you're emitting energy from the surface of your sphere. Mm. And the further and further away you go, yep. the amount of energy is fixed, but the area over which it is... Um, needing to be measured becomes larger because larger, yeah. the radius is getting larger and larger. Yeah. So flux density is a, a, a term to try and capture that. Okay. So we're measuring the power that comes or the energy that comes from a source over a particular angular scale. Mm -hmm. But of course that source is transmitting in all directions. Mm -hmm. So if you're actually at trying to understand the intrinsic output of the source, you need to take that into account. So that's why you kind of, there's, there's, there's a lot of orthogonal distance calculations yeah it's why the spot. So it's, it's, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. It, we want to not understand what it is that we measure mm -hmm. but what the universe is actually doing so yeah. what's the intrinsic property of the source yeah. so you have to be able to say um, I'm measuring this amount of information but it's limited because it's been spread out over a larger area or things like that so knowing how far away this source is I can understand how much energy it's spread over, um, you know, the area sort of surrounding it, and how much we're measuring, and therefore work out what it would be transmitting itself. So yeah. that does that make sense? Absolutely. So that distance, it's it's almost as if you're looking at, you're trying to make uh, something which is apparently just flat because of the way we look at it. You're trying to actually create an extra extra dimension by using those comparative uh, measurements? Well, it's uh, more that we're just trying to understand what would happen if we didn't uh, have the distance between us or if we were actually at the source ourselves. It's like taking a candle. Mm -hmm. If I put a, a candle in front of someone, um, you will see a lot of light and heat if you're right next to it. If yep. I go and put it a kilometre away, you, you won't feel any of the heat, it'll have been dimmed, mm. um, but you might uh, be able to see some of the light. And by understanding how far away that candle is and how much light you've detected, you can work out what it'd be like if you put it in front of you. Front of me, yep. So that's what we're trying to do mm. with that. Mm. So in the end of it, there's one candidate that came out, but it happened not to be a transient. Correct. Okay. They're very rare, these, these sort of exoplanet um, transients and um, mm. flare star transients. Yeah. yeah, that's 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 really uh, okay. This is where the technical <laughs> part is getting overwhelming for me. That's all right. Um, uh, so yeah, ask whatever you want. So okay, good. when we look at really the the low frequency part of this, uh, so low luminosity objects. Uh, now we're kind of swinging to a different part of your work, which is to correlate the active galactic nu nuclei of earlier galaxies, uh, which are elliptical. Uh, with those low frequency uh, radio emissions, you can sort of really distinguish between those elements that are known to have those pulses, but with low luminosity uh, objects in the sky. Is this some kind of work that gives you more of a, a morphology of an object? Can you find morphology by using radio astronomy? On yes, so um, what we're doing with low frequency radio telescopes when we're looking at AGN is we're looking at the radio emission which is produced by synchrotron radiation from electrons spiraling in a magnetic field. So you have a supermassive black hole sitting at the center of your optical host galaxy which in the majority of cases is an elliptical galaxy. Yep. And that produces two jets of material that shoot out perpendicular to the accretion disk um, where you've got magnetic fields and electrons and the electrons spiral around those magnetic fields and they give rise to synchrotron emission. Synchrotron emission actually occurs over 
a very broad part of the electromagnetic spectrum, but the um, very energetic parts of it, the high frequency parts, uh, decay away first. They stop radiating first. So the low frequencies are um, visible for longer. And so what you see when you look at a, a radio galaxy, for example, which is an AGN with huge big radio lobes, so you've got two jets and then two lobes of um, radio emissions sit at the end of that, is with a high frequency telescope you see the components which are younger. And so you see the morphology, but you also get an indication of the age of the electron population. With the low frequency part, you see the older parts, you see the whole structure. So you see the true morphology of it with a low frequency radio telescope as compared to a high frequency radio telescope. So we do two things. We map the structure of these objects in a way that you can't do with other parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, and we also understand the ages of the electron plasma which is producing the radio emission. So there's two different aspects to that. Now, if things are very, very old in the universe, so if you've got very old radio galaxies, you might not see them at all with a high frequency radio telescope. So when I say high frequency, I'm talking about, you know, a gigahertz, gigahertz uh, to, so. to three gigahertz. So traditionally, um, the very large array, for example, operated in that regime. Yep. But when you um, look at them with a low frequency radio telescope, you may actually be able to see these remnant lobes. So a lot of the work that I do is using low frequency radio telescopes to look for the remnant lobes of radio galaxies, which the AGN has switched off. So the, um, the black hole is probably not being fed material anymore, mm -hmm. and it's switched the jets off, and so they just stop, and over time they cease to be visible in high frequencies, but you can only see them with low frequencies, so you see this old plasma. So we're finding out something about um, when black holes switch off when we look for these uh, remnant radio galaxies. Wow. So using those two specs, so I think the first one is uh, gigahertz yep. peak spectrum? That's, that's a class of uh, radio galaxy that have the uh, largest amount of emission in gigahertz okay. and then decay. So that's the other way. They, they are very compact objects, um, so very different to the things I'm talking about. I'm talking about things with like enormous radio jets, mm -hmm. many, many times bigger than the galaxy that hosts them, wow. um, being sort of spewed out into the universe. So okay. gigahertz peak, peak spectrum sources are, are a different thing. Different thing. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, so if we kind of look at a jet coming out of this uh, could you geometrically kind of give an understanding for people who can't see? I mean, a jet would be something that kind of, let's say, if we took a galaxy, see if you look at it from the side, it's almost like an egg sunny side up on both sides with kind of a bulb in the middle and the active galactic nuclei, which is surrounded by this, this kind of radio emission. But the jet is kind of like a fork sticking out of that from the side. Well, so there's two things. So first of all, the ones that look like eggs with a bulge in the center and then sort of a disk of material around them, they're, they're spiral galaxies. Yep. So spiral galaxies are not normally the host of um, radio, large-scale radio jets. So there are a very small number of spiral galaxies known to host radio jets at scale, but yep. mostly all of the active galactic nuclei that we see in the universe are actually elliptical galaxies. So they look like footballs. Yep. So they're sort of cigar shaped um, to sort of totally spherical. Mm. So they range through different elliptical classifications. Okay. So what we see when we see a radio galaxy is we see just two jets sticking out um, perpendicular to each other from these elliptical galaxies. So if you took yeah two forks and shoved them in an American football, mm -hmm. that's sort of what they look like, except that that's just the very first part of the jet. Yep. Now what you've got to do is attach... Um, you know, a sort of a huge big balloon that you might travel in mm -hmm. to either end of the forks, um, and that's what the cloud of electrons kind of looks like. So uh, huge it, big things. Okay, so those, almost as if, if you took, for instance, uh, the magnetosphere on the planet, on our planet, yep. um, you have this kind of directional, um, it's almost like a fountain that starts up and then goes down. Yeah. And the fountain creates a counter fountain, which itself reverses uh, the flow of electrons. 
uh, would that be a good interpretation? Yeah, but on a huge scale. So on if you think of scale, yeah. if you think of the case of the Earth, the the sort of the height above the Earth that that yep. process happens is less than the radius of the Earth, right? So yep. you're not going a long way out from the Earth. Mm. Um, with a radio galaxy, you'd be going out to, you know, probably Jupiter with the um, mm. the size of the uh, emission region. Right. So they're they're very different objects in that sense. Just kind of getting back to how you know we look at those emissions. Uh, what is the term optically thick? So what it means is the optical light's blocked. So mm. optically thick means that you have a medium which is sufficiently dense that mm. optical light won't transmit through it. Yeah. So you can't see through it with optical. Whereas optically thin is the reverse. So you can actually have um, optical light be transmitted from one side to the other. One side to the other, okay. So we talked about the, the synchrotron, right? But there's this uh, term called synchrotron uh, self-absorption. Yeah, synchrotron emission happens across a large chunk of the electromagnetic spectrum. Yeah. Um, in, the, in some objects, uh, the material that surrounds your black hole um, reabsorbs the the synchrotron emission at particular frequencies, so you get a turnover in the in the spectrum. Yep. It's um, to do with the physical properties of what is sitting around your host galaxy. Yeah. So that's that's what that is. So I mean, um, you can have radiation, which is what synchrotron is, be um, absorbed by by matter. You can have a photon come in and be absorbed and knock an electron out or ionize an electron or depending on what material you're dealing with. Um, but that photon's then gone, it's not going to transmit out into the universe. So that's what that's about. Okay. And those, when you look at it from one angle, uh, because there's that absorption, but if the absorption rate increases to a certain point, uh, would that be what is called a spectral break? Uh, so a spectral break is where you have... Um, if you imagine the amount of power yeah. that you've got at different frequencies being uh, plotted, mm -hmm. so you've got a, a, a graph where you have the frequency on the x-axis, so the, the strength if you like, yep. on the y-axis, yep. and it follows a straight line up until a certain point, and then it follows a different straight line. So it, it doesn't, you've got two straight lines mm -hmm. which have different slopes. Yep. And the point at which they have that different slope is usually a spectral break. It's a spectral break. Yeah. So something happens there to cause the mm -hmm. the spectrum um, to change slope. Okay. So this is this is really we're talking about trying to map something which is dynamic. I mean, it moves, and we're trying to really dig back into you know the age of the electrons, the yep. um, the collisions of uh, you know different types of particles the absorption of particles, the breaks, uh, you know, almost as if we're looking back in the past to see what kind of flow uh, the actual object is having. Yeah, well this is physics, right? So physics is yeah. using the information that you can collect to understand what's happening yeah. um, in, in an object. So we use whatever we can collect to do that. Um, and in terms of looking back at the past, well, astronomy is always looking back at the past because light has, has a finite speed. That's right. So. Anything we see is how it was, not how it is today. So if we could magically sort of be in a wormhole and go there, it would be totally different to what we observe. Yep. Um, e even, you, even you and I, um, I perceive you as slightly younger than you actually are because the light bouncing off your face and being perceived by my eyes mm -hmm. does take a finite amount of time to do that. <laughs> that's, so, that's a good way to put it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I guess, you know, radio astronomy can, is attempting to answer a couple of quite important questions. So plasma physics and space physics. Yep, yep. And plasma physics is really, when I look at it from a computer science perspective, it's almost trying to solve the MP complete problem so that we can really take a gigantic graph of billions and billions of nodes and then be able to predict the snapshots. Um, but in terms of you know the that part of, of, of radio astronomy, how much um, 
how much can we really transfer this to real world applications? I don't think plasma physics is the real world application that we're transferring uh, the knowledge from radio astronomy to, but you know, the fact that we have Wi-Fi is due to radio astronomers, so the, the Wi-Fi standard was actually come up with by um, radio astronomers who were trying to analyse signals from a radio telescope in Australia to look for black holes. Yeah. So every Wi-Fi chip on the planet um, is the result of radio astronomy mm. Um, mm. in some sense. Your medical imaging has benefited from the uh, pioneering work done on imaging with radio telescopes. The interferometry is a is a similar technique to used by medical imaging um, and analysis. High yeah, high precision to- uh, geometrical and topological mapping. Yeah, uh, all from, sorts of stuff. Yeah, the way that we curate data in astronomy is, as it turns out, very similar to how they curate seismic data mm-hmm. from um, you know oil and gas fields so there's a whole bunch of interesting correlations between how you store and analyze and extract knowledge out of those data uh, between radio astronomy and and seismic data sets there's a whole bunch of different things that we that we work on Um, so I think the the overarching point I tend to make when people ask about this is that Coming back to the thing that we talked about at the start that inspired me to, to be an astrophysicist was that I wanted to understand the night sky, I wanted to understand my place in the universe. To be able to do that, I have to, with my colleagues, come up with new techniques to image with radio telescopes, new techniques to remove sources of error, um, to get us closer to the answers that we're trying to, to find. And that curiosity drives us to do things which are then applicable elsewhere and help humanity uh, advance in other ways. So we're, as a collective, scientists doing this sort of stuff all the time, and you don't really know where the work that you do will get deployed. So, I mean, look at John Nash. So yeah. that's a perfect example of something that he didn't intend. He was just, you know, doing his thing, and it ends up being this major thing in economics. Um, all science is like that, and radio astronomy is no exception. And it, one of the interesting parts of radio astronomy, it's also applied to debunk uh, certain things. Sure. All uh, science should be. <laughs> <laughs> one of them is really interesting is that in 2017, there was an object which was uh, um, observed in the sky, which had some unusual properties uh, and, and an yep. unusual kind of shape, and which was taking kind of a parabolic um, uh, trajectory and you know kind of visiting us in some ways and uh, i think the name is umuamua yep so i think that comes from a hawaiian name yep that's yep. correct umuamua so what's funny is that um this this object kind of was you know the seat of a lot of you know like fertile imaginations going really far away yeah uh but uh what you have used is, is, is you've used the um, MWA to, to actually observe the object and they use different bands to see if it was emitting anything intelligent. Yes. So I thought, I thought that was really interesting. Like what, so this is really what a, one of the advantages of the MWA. And you can do that with many other objects as well, I guess. You know, in, in kind of the culture of, you know, the imaginary and sci-fi and things like that. Well, if an object's disappearing out of the, you know, out of the radar and reappears, it might have some technologies which is way beyond, you know, yep. what we can think of. So when we use the MWA to check the signals that were being observed, I think, with the MWA is there are different bands, narrow band uh, pulses, persistent signals, yep. and like wider broadband signals, so the, so the ones that we actually use ourselves to communicate uh, in, in different ways. So uh, what it seems like in the article, you said that those actually failed to find any kind of you know, yeah, we transformational it. Yes. <laughs> messages coming from that object. So it's most likely a kind of a comet, which has you know, been burnt by a lot of cosmic rays and it lost its ice and everything. Yep. Um, but what are the possibilities, you know, to actually combine what the NWA is doing and some of the the new uh, ones in construction, like the square kilometer array, and maybe just putting it together with the, you know, uh, James Webb uh, telescope, which is coming out next year in March, I think. Just combining all of these to find different other ways of communicating. Well, we can certainly receive signals that are 
as I said, they're ancient, right? Yep. So we can we can do that. Yeah. Um, I don't think you can get past the human biology of needing to be able to analyze them and understand them in the lifetime of a human being. We're mm -hmm. kind of stuck with that. Yeah. Um, I mean, you can keep records and so forth, but I think it would be difficult to get a funding uh, agency to uh, give you that much money to keep searching for um, extraterrestrial intelligence beyond single people's lifetimes. In fact, I, I know people who would argue it's hard mm -hmm. even now just for, for one lifetime. Yeah. let alone multiple lifetimes. So I think we're still limited in that sense. Yeah. Um, radio astronomy allows us to look for um, signals which we can't otherwise explain. So you can slice and dice the data in different ways uh, to sort of see if something's there. So this is what we did um, with this visiting comet, if you like, and didn't, yeah. didn't detect anything. Um, and so if indeed we do have emissions in the radio band which are um, detected and periodic in some sense or even aperiodic mm -hmm. um, and can't be tracked to uh, a celestial object then there's an opportunity to sort of argue for extraterrestrial intelligence. But I think humans are probably still limited in the way we think about what kind of signals you can have. That's right. Yeah. So asking if there are other types of signals that you could imagine that we haven't yet come up with, well, probably. Um, you could imagine if something had enough energy, you could potentially send gravitational signals, for example. Um, but you need a hell of a lot of energy to be able to do that to warp space-time. So, or to at least do it in any kind of way that could be perceptible elsewhere. Um, so I think electromagnetic radiation is probably still the best way to look for this sort of stuff so I think the SETI programs in the radio and also in the optical are um, probably our best bet um, I was uh, when I was a kid you know there was this sort of discussion the Carl Sagan cosmos and so forth yes. people talking about using hydrogen as the the natural um, method of communication so there's the um, I guess there's the 21 centimetre spin flip transition of neutral hydrogen which we see all over the universe so you could potentially use those sort of things as natural carriers but uh, I never really believed that I thought that you know you still we don't use it so um, I don't think other civilizations would potentially do that either so I think we're still better off just searching the electromagnetic spectrum for things that we can't um, necessarily tie to celestial objects. Well, this is going to be a really interesting conversation uh, I'll be having with uh, Seth Shostak. Ah, Seth, City. right, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, when I'm going to be going to uh, to the U.S., uh, and we're really certainly going to discuss about you know all of these possibilities. And, yes, and uh, Seth is the expert. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I guess in terms of our humanity, I mean, we spoke about how we are limited biologically uh, yeah. almost every day. It seems as though out there we have new discoveries. Um, using these tools, and I looked at the uh, the list of new spacecraft which are scheduled by NASA. Oh, yeah. It is absolutely mind-boggling. It's 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 crazy the, the the number of different new sensors coming out. Um, um, and one thing I forgot to kind of cover very quickly. I would like to cover it here. We're talking about electromagnetic uh, the electromagnetic spectrum. Yeah. Um, there was this phenomenon called magnetic return, which I saw in one of your papers, and I was very intrigued by it. Um, is that actually, uh, now that I think about it, is that actually still this component, you know, where, for instance, in our magnetosphere, we have that return, you know, the, the uh, it's almost like a... This wasn't in one of the solar papers, was it? It was about the sun? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so it's exactly the same. So, so it's yeah. closing your loop, yes. Closing so, the loop that Yes. Way. Okay, so, all right. Yeah, so we see this always with, mm. with magnetic fields in compact objects. So mm. um, you want to have your magnetic field lines closed. You don't yep. really want them open to infinity. Okay. So that's what that's about. Okay. Um, now I have one question, and that would be for uh, young people out there who are visually impaired or blind. Mm -hmm. To you, the importance, you know, the, the, the career path that you've taken, the importance of, importance of astronomy is, you know, it's about discovery, it's also about, um, 
really, you know, being able to take that curtain of the universe and just open it up a bit more and understand it better. And um, what kind of message would you give those kids? I would give those kids and any kids the message that you should follow your heart and follow your path to curiosity. And if you're curious about something, then, and you know, you want to understand it, then, and that's your dream, then follow that dream. You don't need to be sighted to be able to contribute to humanity or our understanding of our place in the universe. So I think anyone can do that as long as they want to put their minds to it. So I happen personally to think in pictures. And so for me, pictures are very, very important. But I've met many people who, you know, you can show them something they can't remember it 30 seconds later because they think in terms of sound. So what's said is more important. They interpret things and use their brains in different ways. And so I would say to anyone, if you have a dream and you have curiosity and you want to contribute, do it. Follow your dream. There you go. And this, this message is also going um, to Luke, uh, who's currently taking physics and mechatronics as a, and is congenitally blind. I find he's got a great motivation but also he's got a great amount of imagination. That's uh, what you need. Yeah, a lot of imagination and being able to, uh, to map and create these things. Um, well, before I say thank you, I would like to give you this. Thank you. I don't know if you can identify that one, but It's like you... a Ryan to me. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. That's super cool. I will put this on my key ring. Awesome. Uh, oh, cool. Yeah, it's a little pebble, but um, a bit later this year, you'll be able to just uh, put it in front of the camera if you have an iPhone. Yep. And it'll bring up Orion in 3D. Oh, really? Yeah. How cool. Yeah. That's an awesome idea. Yeah, it's pretty cool. I thought it was, you know, we, we played around with that. And uh, yeah, I guess I think we, we've kind of covered everything. Um, and thank you very much for also giving, giving us further intuition about how we can sonify everything. Uh, you know all of the, the, the work that you're doing the different types of techniques and I think uh, Hopefully we can you know try to find a way to associate this to a sound interface where blind people can really do the same thing as you do now um, oh. and observe and analyze and and play around <laughs> Yeah, yeah. well that's well. that's the thing playing around is how you discover things right yeah, find yeah. things that you don't expect exactly leads you down paths to, to new things and new avenues new so avenues, yeah. yeah cool that'd be awesome yeah. well thank you so much for uh, coming and talking to me and giving me the opportunity to talk about the MWA and the work that we do yeah no, it was a it was a real pleasure and you know good luck with the rest and I think you know the SKA is coming up soon so I'm sure you're gonna have a lot of collaborative work and exciting things ahead absolutely definitely all right all right thank you <laughs> cool Whew. this podcast is made possible by the Morgan prize for blind ambition organized by the san francisco white house for the blind